next installment of the Digital Forestry Seminar Series. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Bedri Benesh, uh, professor in our computer science department. He and I started working together about 20 years ago, looking inside of logs and trees using uh, CT scanners. I'm still looking uh, inside trees and logs and you know, now is uh, when way beyond that and I'll uh, start looking at all kinds of AI tools and, and other things. And uh, maybe even five, six years ago, we joined something in this digital forestry efforts. And uh, here we are today. I think you could have read at the announcement all of his esteemed accomplishments, right? One of the hardest things that we do uh, when dealing with trees, boards, and uh, live things is hard to make replications, right? And how to run experiments because we, there's no two trees or, or logs or boards that are exactly the same. So it's hard to estimate it. And I think that's kind of topic of your presentation today. Thank I you. Thank you. And appreciate there it. is Bedri. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks for the organizers for organizing this and for inviting me. Uh, I hope that it's going to be inspiring. And uh, if it brings more questions into your heads, then I succeed. And uh, like on the way here, I noticed that I didn't think about any joke. <laughs> so then I was thinking that like, you know, it's I'm from copy of science. So you will see one hour of differential equations and no images. No. <laughs> So uh, it's called Generative AI for Tree Digital Twin Reconstructions. I try to put all the important keywords into this everything, and let's see how they how they how they go together. So uh, this is a motivation. This is some university in uh, Midwest. Then there is a tree, and uh, what we can do, we can take images of the tree. We can somehow scan it, and what we want to do, we want to reconstruct. We want to have the model inside. The computer and we want the model to be OI. So we got data from Ayman Habib, then we got point cloud, and then my talented students were able to reconstruct it into the three-dimensional model. What we can do with the three-dimensional model is that we can bring it to life by, for example, simulating physics thanks to Boshing over there. So we can simulate how it interacts with wind. We can simulate how branches would be breaking and uh, what we can eventually do, and this is probably the most exciting thing, we can see how the tree would look like in the future and how it may like in the past, so we can simulate its growth. So this is a brief introduction. This is what we would like to do at scale. And uh, I will try to show you how the recent advances in AI are helping us to achieve these goals. So. Uh, this is the traditional pipeline that we have. So on the left-hand side, you have something that is you know, growing out there. Then inside your computer, you have three-dimensional model that has been captured and somehow reconstructed. But what we want to do, we want to get its digital twin. And the digital twin is kind of buzzword. I will try to clarify what we mean you know, in digital forestry by, by having digital twin. So it's a computer represent representation of a real world object. And the computer representation can be code, can be three-dimensional set of uh, triangles, can be pretty much anything. The most important thing is that it captures the shape and the function of the object. The function is the new thing, and it differs from traditional modeling and simulation that we do have the real world object at the beginning. In simulation, what we often do is that we have some hypothetical scenario. We say, let's say that you know we have this terrain and we see how the trees would look like all this. In this case, in the case of digital twins, we start with something that is real and we try to bring it into the computer. Okay. So this is probably the most important thing. And this is how you know many, many years of research are coming together into this new domain. And I will show you what are the new opportunities. So what we traditionally do is that we go into three-dimensional reconstruction. So we get three-dimensional repl replica that is static. That doesn't move. This is just a set of triangles. And then we go into the digital, digital twin. What we try to do is to avoid the reconstruction and go directly into the digital twin by using you know, some AI approaches. So we usually go into some kind of dirty data that have been captured by uh, 
uh, LIDARs or by images or by videos or something. And then we go and try to get the digital twin directly. So uh, why are they useful? Well, the opportunities are endless. It's a snapshot of reality. And it's a snapshot of reality that you have inside your computer. So we all probably carry our life in images on our cell phone all the time with us. So imagine that you could have trees or any objects that would be represented inside your digital cell phones. And you could look at the trees and say, hey, how will it look like you know, in 20 years? And you slide and you will see how this will look in 20 years. So this is the overall idea. And this is, by the way, the motto of the digital forestry, you know, trying to measure, and I would say, and to understand, should be probably added every tree. Uh, so they live inside the computer. If you think like, how can it be? This is so arrogant, you are right. There are heavy, heavy limitations to this everything. So what we usually try to do, we try to extract some important features that we try to simulate. It can be response to light. It can be response to drought or something. So we do not claim that we can simulate everything. It's not perfect replica. It's some humble replica with the objective of trying to simulate some important features. And the important thing is that they can be used for experimentation. So you can ask the famous what if scenarios. And the important thing is that they can be stored for future comparison. So you can go to the same tree 10 years later. And if you get a new digital twin, then you can see how wrong your first tree was. You can measure the distance between them. You can see how good or bad they are. So this was the brief introduction. And uh, this is the overall uh, talk overview. I will talk about these different things. And uh, I will start with the tree representation. Now, if at certain point you get lost, uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature. So what I do, I explain some things on the level that I hope that people from different fields can understand. But at certain points, I will just like press the nitro on the dashboard and I will get into some mathematical representations. So if this is not your cup of tea or coffee, then it's intentionally, but I hope that later when I swim on the surface, then we will stop drowning and we will, we will understand how it goes together, okay? So <clears throat> tree can be represented as a mathematical model that is a graph. And uh, it's a data structure that is it's well known, commonly used. The problem is that what we need to do, it needs to be oriented and without loops. So this is example of a tree. Interestingly enough, trees in computer science and in math are upside down. They have a root on the tip. And in, in the Max Planck Institute in computer science, for a long time, they were hanging the Christmas tree upside down because this is the representation that is used in these departments. It's a geeky insider joke, but I think it's fun. So it's a mathematical graph. So what we can do, we can, to every vertex, we can assign some meaning. So if you look at this tree, uh, it can say that there is a piece of branch that goes forward. The B are branching points. And what we can do, we can assign some geometric information to these nodes. So we can mathematically represent tree and we can assign some geometry to it. What we can do, we can also add growth to it. So the development is simulated by extending the edges of the graph or by adding new ones. What we can also do, we can add material properties. So Ravos Gazos' favorite young modules can be added. And then what we can do, we can simulate physics. That is something that we did in 2014. We can see how the trees respond to wind. And behind this, everything is, is inside your computer, the mathematical representation plus physics. Now, the interesting thing is that what you can do, you can mathematically take the tree and you can store it as a linear structure that is called L string. And uh, if you look at the L string, then different parts correspond to different parts of the tree. So this F plus F, F means you go forward, then you turn right, and then you go forward. And this is the exact beginning of the tree, as you can see here. Now, the parentheses indicate branching. So this outmost branch corresponds to this giant part of the tree. Then you can look inside and it turns out that you know the end branches are, uh, this is the beginning of the large branch. Uh, this is ending of some other branch and everything that is outside the parentheses is outside of the branching structure. So what you can do, you can take the mathematical representation 
and you can store it as a something a computer can understand better as a string. So this is a tree representation. This is how we represent trees in computer science and in math. Now, the question is, what is the neural symbolic representation? Mm -hmm. So let me explain a little bit how the deep learning works. You probably are well aware that deep learning usually works with unstructured data, such as images, point clouds. We also call it dirty data. So you look at the image and your brain can interpret it in some way, but for a computer it's pretty complicated. So the new AI, the new that is based on deep learning, achieved incredible things. The detection of objects is better than humans can do it. I don't know if you get goosebumps from this, I do. So this is used, for example, in medicine, you know, for early stages of cancer detection, if doctor looks at it, you know, doctor that has been detecting cancer for decades, and then you show it the AI model, the AI model is better. So they can detect cancer much sooner. This is incredible if you think about it. Then on the other hand, there is something that is called good old fashioned AI. This was the pre-winter that used explicit knowledge representation as if then statements, as some kind of graphs and so on. So the new thing that is something that we are trying to do in our research is neural symbolic representation, where we have some symbolic representation of geometries and functions, and we try to find the corresponding neural model that can learn it automatically. So instead of using dirty data like images, we find some meaning of it, and then we use AI to extract information and to handle this information. So let me show how it works and how these two things put it. Have you noticed that I talked about strings and then I jumped into something totally different? I didn't because the strings are neuro symbolic representation. Okay. So the strings have been used for a long time. And uh, what we want to do now for the digital twinning, we want to use internally the neuro symbolic representation and go from data to digital twin by using this. So this is the key message from my presentation today. Okay. Now, uh, see, so the idea is okay, we can take the strings. There is all the geometry and topology, everything is encoded in it. And uh, let's take large language model. If you have not heard the term large language model, you heard the term ChatGPT. ChatGPT is one of many large language models. Okay, so we didn't use ChatGPT in Jejun, who I don't see. Oh, over there, uh, it was the main brain behind this everything. So we took large language model and we thought, okay, let's take the long strings. There are very long, there are like hundred thousands of symbols. And let's learn it. Let's just take it off the box. And uh, spoiler, we could not. And there were two reasons for this. So the first reason is that short distance in the string, meaning if you count the letters, may correspond to long distance in the tree. So if you look at those two symbols, that are next to each other in the string, they are very far in the real tree. And vice versa, long distance in the string, they actually correspond to short distance in the tree. So we thought that this was the main reason. And uh, when we tried the LLM just to apply it, it couldn't remember the attention between the beginning and the end. It couldn't clearly map what was happening internally. And also it generated unbalanced strings. So, this is called data-centric AI. And the data-centric AI basically means that if you have a problem, you throw more data on it. And you use some foundational model, and by adding data, the response gets better and better and better. In this case, by adding more data, the response gets exactly the same because you will have unbalanced parentheses. So we did some deep dive into this, and this was a paper that was presented this year where we thought, okay, so many things in the trees repeat at different levels of hierarchy. If you look at the tree, they are called, they are self-similar. That is a term from fractals and fractal geometry. Meaning if you look at different scalings, it turns out that the things have similar angles and several similar lengths of intervals with approximately similar scaling. So the question was, can we learn hierarchies and can we get rid of the parentheses? Because the parentheses were really wreaking havoc into this everything. Okay, so if you look at the innermost parentheses, 
in the string, they correspond to the outermost branches. So the idea was, okay, we find what is the innermost and we replace it with a symbol. And the symbol will be replacing the right-hand side. So if you look at the past one, we have a string that has four less parentheses. So we got rid of the outer higher level hierarchy. Then we take the new string and we apply exactly the same. We take the innermost parentheses that corresponds to the outermost branching and we replace it by one symbol. And eventually, if you do this sufficient amount of time, you end up with a string that is no parentheses. Cool. So then what we did, we took the auto shell transformer, that is the quote unquote chat GPT, but not chat GPT, and we did some important things around it, like encoding the left hand side to the right hand side. And there was a lot of work in making sure that we can express it in the terms that the AI model can understand it. And I don't want to go into all details. One important thing is that the model needs to know about the species. So this was trained for different species. And uh, so we have the transformer token. This is the thing that wakes it up. And I don't want to bore you with this too much. So let me just show you some, some video towards the end. Oh, important thing, we need to train it. So we need a lot of data. And uh, so what we did, we took our developmental model that was again generated by Quashen over there. And uh, we generated a whole bunch of synthetic trees. And then we, gen we generated the L strings from the synthetic trees. And then this was used for training the deep neural model. So the usual question that we get from the reviewers when they send these papers is, why didn't you use real trees? And the answer is on my last slide, last slide, because there is no data for this. And this is the second most important message for my presentation. We need somebody to go out and reconstruct real trees because there are no reliable data sets. So what we essentially did, we learned our own data. So uh, we generated 155,000 synthetic trees for six big species. The data is out there. If you go to our webpage, you can download it. And uh, this is the old tree. This is when you get it into the deep neural model. And the key thing here is that for every level of hierarchy, we use AI to replace the string with a new one. And the generator has been trained on the tree data. In other words, you end up with something that looks like this. This is a plant root, and this is generated for different species. And we implemented all kinds of metrics that are comparing how similar the trees are. And in the mathematical world, these trees are similar. So the most important message from this is that AI can learn and encode biological tree structure. That for us was surprising. We were very happy with this. And the really interesting thing is that the neural model that actually learns the branching and this everything is like one megabyte long. So it's virtually nothing. And we kind of felt that this some way it's inspired by DNA that does something similar. So uh, there is interesting observation that if you look at the branching angle and you start quantizing it, meaning if one angle is 90 and the other is 90.1, then you say the other is 90 as well. So you start rounding. So if you do something like 1% of the original data, the tree is still very similar. Let me explain. This is the, this is the original tree. This is the original tree. And this is when you start rounding the branching angles together. And eventually, if you have only seven branching angles, it moves very similar to the input. Only when you get three different branching angles, it starts degrading, meaning trees have very low information content. It's highly repeating at different levels. So we were quite surprised with this, but don't forget we used our own data. So this is not real trees. We would like to repeat this with real trees. So uh, let's go to function, okay? So I have shown that with some success, we can replicate the biological structure of trees by using AI models. Now, let's see what we can do with the function. So imagine that you are a tree bud, 
uh, not to be confused with the average alcoholic beverage, but is the growing tip uh, of either lateral or apical branches. Oh, I made a joke, awesome. So <laughs> imagine that you're a butt. So you are at certain location in 3D space and you may be thinking, okay, what is next? So what you do is that you open your diary and you look what happened before, meaning how much water you have, nutrients, what is your age, and you also look at the environment around you. And from this, you decide, okay, I will branch maybe into two branches, or you decide I will go in this direction, okay? So this was a point of view that we tried. It's again, uh, if anybody here is from biology, I apologize for the extreme simplifications, okay? So we call this approach situated latents. By situated, we mean that this is somewhere in a three-dimensional space. So we have some extrinsic data coming in. That is the amount of nutrients, light, and so on. And the latent means that it has some intrinsic information coming from the diary of what happened before. So the question is, can neural model learn it? So this was Zarchen sitting over there. This is how we simulate uh, growth of trees in computer graphics. We have apical lateral buds, we have some internal signaling, uh, and the buds move and grow and range and so on. And uh, I don't want to go too much into details. The important thing is that the models also react to the environment. This is all simulated environment, okay? And uh, if you do it correctly, you end up with trees that look like this. It's our paper from 2023. Uh, so you have different species, you have conifers, uh, a lot of different things. So, oh, by the way, I have to put this here. This is my PhD thesis from 1997, where I simulated how trees react to light. To light. It took four days to calculate the simulation on the silicon graphics computer. And uh, it was 27 years ago. So yeah, we can do this in real time these days. Uh, you can see that the light is coming like over the fence, so the overall shape of the tree reacts to light somehow. And this was supposed to be a linden tree. So what we can also do, we can do competition for resources. So we have this small forest where no two branches are colliding and all branches are competing for space in 3D. Uh, okay, so recap. The tree is affected, the shape, is affected by two factors, DNA, uh, DNA and the environment. And uh, so the question is that the given, given location, if you look at the buff, can you describe what is happening and decide what will be the next step? So uh, this is the overall idea of the approach. At every node, we have something that we call the node signature. And the next action is that it either grows or generates one or two or three branchlets. And then we have a deep tree model. So uh, we took eight species, 500 tree, trees per species, that if you look at it, it looks like a small number, but don't forget that we go after individual buds. So every tree has hundreds of thousands. So we have several tens of millions of buds in their position. We took the model from another paper that we had before. And uh, then this is how it looks like. So if you have a bud number eight over here, then it looks like this, and the possible action is that it may grow one of these three branches. So uh, eventually, Zhao Chen got into a deep neural model, and he spent half a year cranking all the details with this. So there is one thing that is called classification network that will decide how many children the node will have. The second is a regression network that will decide its parameters, the branching angle, the distance, etc. And then eventually there is the decision regression pipeline that puts this everything together and says if a bug is at this location, by reading its history and looking forward, it will perform this action. If you plug this everything together, you get a complicated model, but I don't want to talk too much about the details, but this is the output. It's not a crop, okay? It's not a crop. It basically takes every bug at every location and decides what will be the next thing. And uh, then what we tried, we tried to see how this was react to the environment. So we put simple obstacle. And uh, when this was hitting the obstacle, it performed traumatic iteration. 
and deciding to go in some other direction. So cool, we have a not only shape, we also have a function of a tree encoded as a deep neural model. Now, if you, oh, by the way, interesting thing is that it can also read point cloud signature. So as a side effect, it can also reconstruct point clouds. And we were quite surprised with this. So Zaochen just took the NR model, fed it with, with, with point cloud, and turns out that we can reconstruct point clouds with this with certain precision. So uh, side note, if you compare both of them, they take trees, then they, they encode them as some kind of deep neural model, and they generate 3D geometry. Now, both these models are almost orthogonal. They have nothing in common, yet they somehow represent something that is very similar. So we made the news about it, and it kind of hit. I, I, I would like somebody to translate this one. <laughs> I don't even probably want to know. So let's go to distributions. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, can they find neural symbolic representation for tree localization? So people follow some rules when they plant trees. And the question is, can we encode them? And can we see how this can be learned by neural model? So we have a paper about this in 2022. And uh, there are two main contributions. One is the procedural placement, deciding where a tree will be located. And the second is AI model that can learn it from site like images. So I spent a year and a half of work looking into the procedural models. I talked to experts, I read books, and then we decided how the rules should look like in the very limited scope. And uh, the rules are quite simple. You may have a semi-random distribution. And by the way, when I was looking, when I was making this presentation, I noticed that there is a one tree in the middle of the house. <laughs> and the paper has been published already, and we never noticed this. this is like, so you can have a boundary. This is usually given by the local government. Like there is this strip between the road and your house where you know the, the urban planners plant trees. And you have the beta, that is the parameter. Then you can have clusters that can that can have different sizes and different distributions. You can have Equidistant, people usually use it as a shield between the house and the neighbors. If you don't want your neighbors to see you, you put this artificial fence, and then you can have a single tree. That is a, by the way, special case of the clustering. So, and you can have a regular that is not so common. It's like almost urban plantation, you know, that people, people sometimes do. So we do this everything and we parameterize wise placement models. I don't know if you see the placement model is a neural symbolic representation. It tells you where the trees could be. And uh, if you look at it regular by injecting randomness, you can get more and more random. If you get into semi-random, you get more and more random. What you can do, you can look at the boundary and you can randomize the boundary. You can have different kinds of clusters and so on. So then we took, oh, by the way, the trees grow. We use the developmental model. So we put the tree in the urban environment and then we say grow and it reads the the signature from the illumination, the amount of nutrients and water, and they grow and develop. So then we took a very simple uh, CNN. It's not a news network. It's convolution neural network. It's something else. And uh, CNN can learn the distributions from satellite images and export the parameter values. So uh, this is, of course, the Central Park in Manhattan because it's computer graphics, so we want to show something cool, and we were able to learn this distribution. Then, I believe this is somewhere in West Lafayette, if, not, if, I'm, not, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. And uh, this is somewhere in Chicago. You can see that the, three, the trees are actual three-dimensional models that were captured by these images. And uh, another one. Okay, so the trees, and digital twins in the cities can be learned by neural symbolic models. They can grow, interact with the environment, and we can do a lot of things. We can count them, we can count away the heat, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, let me go to whole lot of trees. It's a reference to ACDC song. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is 
Okay, change you go there. Google Street View, as you have probably noticed, has a tons of three images. So the question is, can we get 3D models out of them? So we were approached by uh, Google people, and uh, this is the output of this. We basically took all the well known all the 600,000 trees from uh, Google Street View. This is a reconstruction that you can get directly by applying AI. And this is a tree developmental model that you can get from the Google Arborist by applying the developmental model that you know, my students have done. Right? And uh, this will be presented when next month. Yeah, next month uh, in, in, in ECCD. So uh, the basic idea is that you take a single image and then you guess the three dimensional envelope from this. That is very ill posed problem because you don't see behind it. And I can tell you right away that if you take the same tree from two different angles, the reconstruction will be very different, very different. But if you want to do it at scale, you have only single image, this is as good as it gets at a given moment. So we needed to somehow validate it. So for many of these trees, we have measured values of their height and the DDH. So if you look at it, this should move it should be approximately at the diagonal. It almost is. And the uh, different colors correspond to different species. So it can, this, re this reconstruction can represent something that we have in the real world. Now, uh, you, what you can do, you can immediately estimate shadow. And uh, we are working with the MIT Sensible Global Labs to, to detect the walkability through the cities. Like if you want to go from location A to location B, we know where the trees are, we know what kind of crown they have, so what is the optimal optimal path to go, and so on. And uh, what you can also do, this is the cool thing is that you can, as I mentioned at the beginning, detect the past and the possible future of the tree. And again, with humble precision, there are tons of limitations. From a single image, you cannot get too much. Now, there is interesting side view. We have 600,000 3D tree models that are out there available. You can download them. They are simulation ready, meaning you can use our framework and simulate past and future. But each tree took about 20 minutes on the state of the art GPU, GPU to reconstruct. So on a single computer, it will take 22.83 years. It's a lot of time. So what we did, we scraped all we could around from RC, RCAC, the supercomputers, anything that was available. And the poor Zauchan got really good at putting his tasks into three pipelines and open open tasks. And eventually, after how many six months, we were able to get this everything reconstructed. It's an approximation. Okay. Now, uh, getting to conclusions. Uh, we need reliable ways to measure trees. That is heavily in sync with the <clears throat> Institute for Digital Forestry. We need reliable things. We can do it with some approximations. But as I have shown, many of the algorithms that we use for the AI representation use simulated data. The advantage of simulated data is that we have them in the computer already. So we know that our algorithms can reconstruct it. We know the exact 3D model. So we have a one-to-one -one representation. If you want to do it, and we want to do it for real trees, we need to reliably measure them first. This is extremely important open problem. Without reliably measuring, we cannot talk about digital twins in anything. You need to have a good input. Simulations in agriculture and biology, they have been here for hundreds of years. They are incredible success stories in many ways. But what we probably need to do, we need to get them closer to the digital twins and make sure that we can connect this algorithm to correctly simulate you know, the shape function and future. Again, the algorithms that we have in computer graphics, that is minefield, are mostly focusing on the shape. But there are many things internally that have zero effect on the shape or very limited effect that are extremely important and we don't even scratch the surface when it comes to simulation. Uh, I showed you three different neural symbolic representations, one for locating trees, the other for growth, and the third for growth and shape. They are totally different. They capture similar phenomena, 
but they are totally different. And one of the biggest questions in many fields of science is, is it possible to have some unified neural signaling representation? One way can be the graphs that I have shown at the beginning, and I hope you see how the story is finally connecting, converging. So the graphs will be, but there may be something else. And uh, it's in, it's extremely exciting task because you know every time we come up with some new idea, we quickly start to test it and test it, and then then it turns out that it fails, and then we are looking why and so on. And uh, we also need reliable ways to reconstruct three models in three D. Not only measure them. Measuring is different from reconstruction. We need three dimensional models. So this is a sneak peek of something that is currently under submission. This is today my talented students. This is a point cloud captured by who by Ayman or by somebody else. Sergeant. Um, it's from the, the open source. Okay. okay. And this is a fully reconstructed baby first. And of course it's approximation, but we're quite happy with this. So let's see what will happen in the future. And the uh, closing thoughts, uh, I, I am true believer that we are still trying to understand what is happening in nature. I don't like the AI washing when you take something and you throw it on AI and it somehow solves something and you have a working solution but you don't know what is underneath. So the neural symbolic representation is bringing some deeper understanding and the AI is helping to build it. So I still think that we can use AI to actually improve our knowledge of the underlying phenomena that are happening. And the most important thing is that we need cross-disciplinary collaborations. I humbly acknowledge all the limitations that the approaches that I was showing here have, because it's coming from one point of view. And uh, what I have noticed, you know, I live in computer graphics world. There is a biology. I see many of my collaborators. These are like separate bubbles in the universe. And what we need to do, we need to just connect them and merge into one bigger, hopefully not popping bubble. And uh, I need to acknowledge all my collaborators. Many of them are dear friends that you know, we've been working together for 15 years. Uh, this is interesting. Soren, I was on his PhD committee. He's a full professor now. And, uh, and of course, the most important, you know, are my extremely talented and very funny and always opposing PhD students. That is the best part. Every time I come up with some idea, then Washington will go, yeah, but the problem is, this is the exciting part. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? So I have a couple of questions. So one, you mentioned you discovered some fractal patterns. Do you expect to do some more paper variant learning? So uh, in 1982, there was a wave of papers that were using fractal geometry. And by the way, fractal geometry is my middle name. Okay, this is my hobby. I love fractal geometry. But in around 1982, 80, there was a wave of papers when they were looking at trees and their fractal properties. So it turns out that it works at certain scales, typically three to four scales, three to five scales, depending on the species. But the problem is that trees are heavily affected by the environment. So if you look at young branches, they have a very clear fractal pattern, but then you know the wind kicks in and they start bending and the internal signal signaling will, 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 will modify the shape and so on. So it has been abundant. Ferns are awesome fractals and they are the affine transformation that can map it. If you send me email, I will happily send you all the papers, but I think it's something that has been abundantly offended. Yeah, also, um, so this is motivated by real life, but do you expect any uh, anything gained the other way? Like does this inform any learning on just the purely abstract data structure of trees? This is what we this is what we want to do all the time. Like we are trying to collaborate with biologists and try to you know convince them that this is something that is very useful. So I hope yes. Yeah. And by the way, yes, I like looking for collaborators.
We said you needed four measurements of trees. What kind of measurements do you need? It depends on the sensors. So and there are not that many. And uh, I will answer by my dream. So I don't know if you noticed that like the humanity is moving by disruptive by, by using disruptive technologies. And what I always like to do, I I'll get to it. Okay. So if you look at old sci-fi movies, how they were envisioning 2024, it's laughable because they make extrapolation from a given point, but they never predicted that there will be cell phones or most of them. So what I think is that at the current state, we are, we are in desperate need of a breakthrough sensor that will be able to capture 3D structure with all the topology. Point clouds are awesome, they are disconnected. Something that will give connected topology and geometry and will be able to penetrate through canopy. Like, I have been reading the papers about point clouds for the past five years, and people tried everything they could, and there are some limits that are not coming from the technology, but from the nature of the technology. So I think we are in desperate need of a breakthrough in this. But it's a sci fi. Yeah. So, uh... Great models for big scale NLP shape morphological features. Uh, and you know, I'm a sensor developer. So nowadays, uh, a lot of the emerging sensors are helping people to be able to capture much finer resolution. So, for example, we are able now to watch, to track the opening and the close of the stomata, that kind of level, microscope level of imaging. We can watch the cell level, how the senescence is changing through the different tissues of the leaf. So at that level of the sensor information and the plant changing information, uh, probably that will give a lot of the pressure on the computational power uh, limitation over there. So, so what, what do you foresee in the future? How, uh, how soon we are able to see all those kind of the details, micro details into this kind of model? But I, I refuse to predict future, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's being recorded and, uh, and I remember the book. <laughs> but I can talk about what is happening. Like, there are many papers in computer graphics that deal with the simulation of vegetation and flowers exactly on the scale. And of course, there are enormous applications in agriculture, you know, in maize, sorghum. And in my second life, you know, this, this is what I do for ground diving and so on. But going back to computer graphics, I have seen papers when they CT scan flowers and reconstructed everything that was inside. So this is happening. I don't think that the computational power is a problem because people usually focus on one thing. So you have one flower or one leaf. Putting this together with the large scale, it's a different question. It would be really interesting to see. And uh, yeah, I will not make predictions, but currently it's really difficult because of the computational problems. But I see this as something that is really important for the future too. So yes, definitely. Do you also use uh, three models for the roots? Yeah, we have paper about this and I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> I, I wanted to keep it because the model is a pure simulation. And by the way, Darla Schultz has a beautiful, beautiful samples of soils that are layered. So what we did in the root simulation, we used you know this, this data, simulated data, and we shown how the water is seeping through different layers then how it goes on the clay underwater and, and how the roots react to this everything. And the interesting observation was that there is a short and long distance signaling increase. So the nutrients affect something that is within limited scope, but then it sends to the shoots on the top and they react to it as well. So this was quite interesting to see. And I wanted to see the you know, dead body and you know how, how the nutrients seep through it and how the food would grow. But then my collaborators refused to work on their body simulation. Yeah, but I can send you a link to it. Like uh, you have shown very interesting thing here. I am working in the sector of remote sensing data basically. So have you used or planning to use in any way like temporal series of high resolution satellite data sets from the above? Uh, and try to link with the what you are simulating and how it is going in that frame. I think 
Freddy is currently working on something great. They are looking to go into, into site like images and stuff like this. And I think it is really important because this is like much different scale for this everything. So this is important. And it goes in tune with that mentioned before with the with the measuring. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and thanks for the time.